know, man, many of you that are in the sound of my voice uh, already have your mind maybe made up or you have your own opinion. Hold with me on this. Let's find out if their agenda worked because ultimately you know it by the fruit. So let's discover if this was a good plan. This dates all the way back to the 6th century B.C., by the way, this Lemuria festival. So they chose this to try to hijack this Lemuria festival, this Roman pagan feast of the dead. So then it was moved again. This time it was moved to Samhain Day. Why? Because noticing that the Celts that they took over, okay, in the first century are still celebrating Samhain. And Samhain's on October 31st through November 1st. So Pope Gregory III in 70, uh, 741 AD moved All Saints Day to November 1st to dedicate the new All Saints Chapel. Makes sense. In St. Peter's Rome. At the same time, making an effort to Christianize the pagan feast of the same, the same name. So what's happening on the same day is that the Catholic Church is attempting to throw holy water on pagan feasts. They're attempting to Christianize something that is demonic. So let me ask a question. Would we all agree that the pagan feast Samhain festival, which was a pagan feast of the dead, is not from God? I want you to remember that. Something that's not from God, God doesn't want. It's a simple logic that we need to remember as we walk through here. So All Souls Day. What is All Souls Day? Well, that happens to be the next day after All Saints Day, November 2nd. Then in 988 AD, the Catholic Church added another day, November 2nd, to remember all of the souls that were suspended in a place called purgatory and needed the prayers of their loved ones. As with the festival of Saul, when the Catholic believers celebrated with huge bonfires, parades and costumes masquerading as dead saints, angels and demons. Altogether, All Saints Eve, October 31st, All Saints Day, November 1st, and All Souls Day, November 2nd, combined into what was called hollow mass or holy mass imitating to the T the Celtic feast of Samhain. So they may not have known this because this is now a thousand years after the Celts were celebrating Samhain for already hundreds of years before that. But these people that were alive at this time that are celebrating in costumes, masquerading as dead spirits, demons, dead saints, bonfires, and all these things were literally imitating the very Celtic, pagan, demonic feast from a thousand years earlier, and they didn't even know it. I submit to you today that we're doing the exact same thing. Call it what you want. Do it however you want. If an ancient Celt showed up today, he'd feel right at home. From All Saints Day to Halloween, how did that jump happen? In 1556, the Scottish term All Hallows' Eve began to be used. So in 1500s is when we see the first term All Hallows' Eve. And so when a famous Christian actor says that this is the original uh, point of Halloween, it comes from All Hallows' Eve, that word wasn't even used until the mid-1500s. Its actual meaning means hallowed evening or holy evening. When the phrase was used in the English language of the West in 1745, it was pronounced Halloween. That's where it comes from. So Halloween comes from All Hallows Eve, which means holy evening. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were to ask even an average Christian, would you consider Halloween Holy. Yes or no? I would bet, I would hope, 90 plus percent would say no. So then if the answer is no, why do we even call it holy evening? Because that's exactly what we're saying. It doesn't matter if it's a coined phrase called Halloween. You're literally saying this is a holy night. So if you're going to be 
at least intellectually honest, and you choose to celebrate Halloween, at least come up with a different name. Then what happened? The Irish potato famine of 1846. How on earth does an Irish potato famine have anything to do with Halloween? <clears throat> you might be thinking to yourself, it has absolutely everything to do with Halloween. Why? Because the Celts come from there. So you have millions of Irish and Scottish settlers that are coming into the United States in the 1840s, and guess what they're bringing with them? The Samhain Festival. This is how it came to America. So in the 1840s is when you see millions of Irish Celts used to celebrating Samhain, immigrating to America during this time, had major, major impact on what Halloween actually looks like today. It's coming all the way back. Thousands of years, the Samhain Festival is reoccurring here in the United States. So let's ask this question. So was the point of All Saints Day or All Hallows Eve to dress up like demons, to show that death was defeated, like some influential Christian leaders would have you believe? Let's answer that question because ultimately it is the reason and fundamental foundation of that particular Christian leader's philosophy, or dare I say theology, of why he believes celebrating Halloween should be uh, not only available to Christians, but we should actually engage in it. That's the premise. Let's find out. What is All Saints Day? Because this is what it is. Halloween is All Saints Day. Catholics celebrate All Saints Day and All Souls Day in the fundamental belief that there is a prayerful spiritual communion between those in the state of grace who have died and are either being purified in purgatory, a holding place, or are in heaven. And the church militant who are the living. So basically, All Saints Day is, is a commemoration where they pray to the dead saints. And the dead saints intercede for them. Even though my Bible tells me when you're dead, you're dead. There is no interceding for the living from the people of the dead. That's what our Bible says. And my Bible says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Yeshua. Not some dead guy. All Souls Day, which is November 2nd, is a day of remembering and praying for the dead to be purified and brought into heaven. So the very two days, All Saints Day and All Souls Day, did not originate with the Catholic Church, but built on pagan, cultic, demonic practices of festivals, they pray for dead Catholic saints and pray for dead Catholic family members that they can get out of purgatory and eventually get into heaven. Nothing in the historical record says that Catholics ever dressed up ever to mock demons or mock death. That is not the historical record as you're going to find out. Let's look into Hebrews chapter 9 and talk about praying for the dead. Verse 27 it says, And as it is appointed for men once to die, but after this the judgment. Once to die then judgment. There is nothing in between of an opportunity to go from death, eternal death, to eternal life once you're dead. Once you're dead, it's over with. Your judgment is sealed. Think about the logic. If you died and you knew there was an eternal life, you probably would repent. Who wouldn't? There wouldn't even be a need for a lake of fire. But beyond that, let's continue. Psalms 115, 17 says, The dead praise not Yahweh, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless Yahweh from this time forth and forevermore, praise the Lord. The dead can't praise the Lord. Think about this. So if they can't praise the Lord because they're dead, how do they pray for you? Because we are to believe, and I, I grew up Catholic to the sixth grade, so I'm very familiar with this. They have all kinds of saints 
that you ask the saint to pray for you. How can the saint pray for you if he's dead and he can't even praise the Lord? Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says, for the, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Why don't they know anything? Because they're waiting for the resurrection. Why? It's judgment. They're not allowed to speak. That's why the witch of Endor, uh, Saul, had to call up Samuel. And Samuel says, what? What did you wake me up for? Necromancy. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10, it says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or is a sorcerer. Listen to this. Or one who conquers spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, or calls upon the dead. Why am I going through all this? Because I'm trying to put some weight and gravity on this holiday's reality of what it means to the ones who made it. This is what they believe. When you celebrate Halloween, you are engaging in a belief system of necromancy. You are engaging in a belief system of calling upon the dead. You may not call upon the dead. You can say all day long, well, that's not what Halloween means to me. Well, when was the last time that God ever cared about what it meant to you? Because the last time I checked, when they hooked up that whole golden calf thing, and they said, tomorrow we're going to have a feast to Yahweh, Yahweh wasn't too happy that that golden calf was replacing Moses, who they thought died on the mountain, and they thought they were worshiping Yahweh through this golden calf. And God said, no, nope, sorry, I understand your hearts are sincere, but I just want to let you guys know something. Let me whisper it in your ear. I don't care about your sincerity. I care that you worship me the way I have asked to be worshipped. Don't build me a golden golden calf. I will not accept it. Matter of fact, I'll call it idolatry. Because what happened in Egypt, outside of Egypt, and when they built that golden calf, ladies and gentlemen, that was the exact same thing that the Catholics tried to do to the Celtic cultic festival of Solomon. They tried to redeem it, sprinkle a little holy water on it, and then worship Yahweh with that. Some of you go, what are you talking about? That, it, 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 the, the golden calf was another god. No, it wasn't. There's two perspectives in the Bible. There's your perspective and there's his. Read the text. From the perspective of the Israelites, Moses has been gone for 40 days. They thought he was dead. And you have to know Egyptian culture and Egyptian religion to know that they did not serve the gods directly. They served them through idols. So when they lost this new god called Yahweh, because they, excuse me, they lost the mediator, Moses, to this new god Yahweh, they knew they could not go directly to Yahweh. So they created another mediator. The text makes it clear. Aaron says, tomorrow we're going to worship Yahweh. So from their perspective, their hearts are true. Their hearts are sincere. They don't want to leave God. They're going to serve Yahweh. That's why they're all excited. Do you really think they're that dumb that they're going to receive the Ten Commandments? They're going to have all the, you know, are, you know they're about to receive the Ten Commandments. The Red Sea opens up. They see this incredible miracle. All the Egyptians behind them die, and they're just going to worship another god at the base of the mountain that, they, you know, <laughs> that they're hearing voices from? No. This is exactly what we're doing. We're taking pagan feast from Egypt, melting it down, recasting it, and offering it to God, and expecting Him to take it. Oh, but it's for the people. It's easier to witness to the people. Let's, let's continue. I'm starting to preach. Any intentional communication with the dead is forbidden in Scripture. And it's called an abomination. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. There is no other mediator. To put a cap on this, think about this. There are so many days of the dead. So for a Christian leader to say 
that this is a Christian holiday. It does not find its roots in paganism. It actually is a, a Christian holiday. And they quote All Saints Day by default. I'm sorry if this, this steps on toes that are out there. But by default, that Christian leader or Christian period is stamping the Roman Catholic Church as Christian. You're literally saying, and you may believe that, and that's fine. But understand what you're stay, saying, Mr. Christian leader. If you have the audacity to say that Halloween is a Christian holiday and doesn't come out of roots of paganism, and we know historically, and you admit in your quote that it comes from Catholicism, then you're saying the Roman Catholic Church, which was about as pagan as the state of Rome at the time that that, that was created, you're literally saying, well, why don't you say that the rest of the Catholic holidays are Christian as well? Why don't you just become Catholic? Because this is not my quote. I just quoted a Catholic bishop. Because that's exactly what their upper echelon leadership doesn't understand. How can Protestants keep our Sabbath on Sunday, keep our holy days, and not be Catholic? Do you know why? Because Protestantism came out of Catholicism. We are simply the red-headed stepchild of Catholicism. We don't know how Catholic we really are. Look how many cultures have a day of the dead, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for getting so fired up. No, I don't, because God's fired up. He's tired of the compromise in his church. This is no Christian holiday, my friends, in origin. If it was, we wouldn't find it in every culture on earth. The Mexican Day of the Dead, El Dia de los Muertos, it goes back to the ancient festival of the dead, celebrated by the Aztecs. The Aztecs were had a day of the dead. Guatemala, this is where Guatemala's Day of the Dead comes from as well. Listen to this, Brazil, China, Japan, Guatemala, Vietnam, Nepal, Philippines, and many, many more. Too many to list. Dozens. All have a day of the dead. So the question becomes, where did they get it from? How could all of these cultures have a day of the dead that predate some of these civilizations' Catholicism? This is why. Because you go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Isn't it something? Nimrod just seems to show up everywhere. Nimrod is the great grandson of Noah. Nimrod was a great and mighty hunter in the land. He's the one that built the cities of Nineveh and Babel. He was the very first deified human being. When you see Baal in your Bible, that's him. He was deified as the sun god. In every known culture around the world, they have a sun god. Hands down. Doesn't matter where you're at, different names, same guy. This is who it is. It's Nimrod. The reincarnated sun god. His wife, Semiramis. Her name in scripture is Ashtaroth. Or Astarte. In Greek, in the anglicization of Ishtar is Easter. That's where we get Easter from. It's the bare-breasted fertility goddess of the East. It's the sun god, Baal's wife. Again, if you haven't heard that, watch Truth or Tradition to get a background on what I'm talking about. This day of the dead goes all the way back to ancient Babel, to Nimrod. And when God sent the angels down to confound the languages, it is the only conceivable theory of how all of these cultures around the world could have the same day of the dead on the same day, most of them. It's incredible, as I research this, to discover that many of these, most of these have the same day, the day of the dead. And there's no way, because they're on completely different sides of the earth, that one could have ever talked to the other. The only conceivable theory is the Tower of Babel. Always you find the sun god, you find Baal, ultimately you find Hasatan. His fingerprints are all over almost everything that we do. 
pagan practices for the dead. Leviticus 19.26, you shall not eat anything with the blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. You shall not shave around the sides of your beard, nor shall you disfigure the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh. What? For the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. A little small rabbi trail for just a second. A lot of people know about this scripture. They say, oh, you know, you want to keep the front of the book. Well, how come you shave? And they quote this scripture. But not knowing that this scripture is directly talking about practices, pagan practices, that the Israelites were starting to adopt from pagan cultures about the dead. And so when their dead would die, the pagan dead would die, their family members would die, they would cut the corners of their beard, they would make markings on themselves, and they would put tattoos on themselves for the dead. And Yahweh tells his people, the Israelites, don't do that. It's against my word. I don't want you doing that for the dead. The dead are dead. Yeshua said it this way, let the dead bury the dead. You can't do anything about it anymore. So focus on the living. 